Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my good friend, Miss Jody Gerson. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. I want to thank you first and foremost uh, for joining us today. I know how uh, how busy folks are, and you have a you have a penchant for helping out and sharing. And uh, yeah. I really am stoked to see so many of my uh, friends in the business take the time to come out and share a little bit. I think it's important as we try to figure out this new music business. You and I have been lucky; we've done pretty well, but. There's a whole new legion of people that are going to mm -hmm. be taking the reins, artists and, and music professionals, and I know that they, they appreciate the uh, chance to get a little mentoring here mm -hmm. online. How about that, right? Absolutely. I'm happy to do it. Great. Um, most of our members on the site are, they would fall into three categories. Either they're artists, musicians, um, they're music industry hopefuls, or um, folks that are just generally interested in the music business. So today what I'd like to do is kind of speak to all of those constituencies. Uh, for the folks that are music industry professionals, we want to talk a little bit about your career, how you got mm -hmm. here, because you've had an extraordinary career. If mm -hmm. you're an artist, or even if you are a professional, then you're writing songs for a living, they have to understand the publishing business, right. and nobody better to talk about that than yourself. Um, so um, you and I know you and I have been doing this a while now. You and I know that it's tough to get a gig in the music business, but the toughest gig to get, I think, is that very first gig. So everybody always asks me when I'm out about how did you get started, so I'll ask you the same thing here. Tell me how you got started in this wacky music business, Jody. I got started, um, I graduated from college in Chicago, went to Northwestern, and I moved to New York, and I met, I networked. It was all about networking. And I laugh because I used to meet people who would take me to parties and I would meet all kinds of executives. And every time I met someone, the next morning, they would get a note from me. Dear Mr. Davis, it was so nice to meet you at the TJ Martell dinner. Um, I, you know, we had a conversation about so-and-so. Every single person got a note from me. And eventually, um, I got a job. I mean, the thing is, in, in, when I first graduated from school, everybody wanted to work at MTV. Yeah. I really <clears throat> wanted a job at MTV. And there weren't jobs at MTV. You know, it was kind of a lean, I just couldn't get a job. And then I thought, I could sell anything. Why don't I go into record promotion? And then I started meeting all the record promo guys at the time. Now it's like a female yeah. business. I mean, it's oh, amazing sure. how many smart, fabulous women do promo now. But I met those guys at the time. I was like, oh, that's Scary, not the job it? for me. Yeah, yeah, not the job for me. And then someone introduced me to, so, so I spent a lot of time, I don't know if you remember Steve Backer, who was at the Steve college. I remember Steve Backer, I see him still. <laughs> he, was the, he was running the college department at Epic Records. Mm -hmm. And friends of mine before me, and then me, used to hang out at his office after we graduated from college. And he would introduce us and make phone calls and take us places. So he had a friend who he'd gone to camp with who was leaving chapel music to become a songwriter. And he was able to get like $100 if he brought in a new person. And so I went in and I got the job, Xeroxing Lead Sheets. I, had no idea what chapel music was. I had no idea what music publishing was. But you, you but you, I read some read up, and 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 you grew up in a show business family. Is that where you kind of got this uh, radar for networking? I grew up, and my dad had a nightclub outside of Philadelphia called the Latin Casino. And from through, I mean, they had it in the '50s, well before I was born. But then in '61, they moved to a big venue in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and so my pretty much my whole childhood until I went to college, it was a nightclub that paid, you know, I mean, it was everyone from Sinatra to Richard Pryor to the Supremes to the Temptations. I mean, amazing. And they played in those days, seven days a week, two shows on Sunday. Sure, sure. So I used to go, my, my mom took my brother and I every Sunday for the matinee so we could spend time with my father and my grandfather. So I was there every week. I think what I got from that was a real understanding of artists and how to connect with them. And the networking was just kind of, you know, I was so ambitious growing up. I mean, I worked at the Mike Douglas show. I mean, that's showing how old I am. Two summers, two summers, um, I think 16, 17, I worked at a radio station, YSP. Um, I worked, I mean, I was so ambitious in a nice way, but yeah. I knew I wanted this. Mm -hmm. So I think the networking came from being comfortable in that world, and also, but the key is, for me, in my career, 
understanding how to connect with artists. Well, I think you bring up an interesting point. One of the things that, that we talk about, and I, I pound into folks, is, is, is a couple things you talked about. One, networking. That's what it's all about. And so to the extent that a show like this could provide some networking opportunities, folks, a chance to talk to, to Jody Gerson, um, that's a big step up. You and I had Huge. to do it very old school. Call, call, call. Oh, we had, it was off, so much harder off. for oh, us. Please. We, it wasn't email. It wasn't even email. email. You don't feel Thank blown off by an email, yeah. but you had to pick up the phone and be brave enough enough to see if they'd pick up. And to get past the 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 the, the guard, the, the secretary. The guard, but that was right? the other key. Like mm -hmm. if you could friendly up to the assistant, mm -hmm. which was really the key, it got you where you needed I, to go. I see people like us know that that was the key. It wasn't the, the person mm -hmm. that you were trying to get to, it was mm -hmm. getting through the gatekeeper. And mm -hmm. we talk a lot about this notion of fuck the gatekeepers. But there's something else you said that I want to make, you know, point out to our folks here today is this notion of making it personal, right? When you said that, I'm, I was grinning because I had the same mentality. You know, everybody was a thank you, was a thank you, was a thank you. And somebody had told me something early in my career. He goes, make believe you're coming back, kid, and you treat everything a little differently, right? That's right. And so you've obviously done that and, and done quite well with that. And, and that's a lesson for all these folks out there just starting. I've also had that thing where I've called a manager, cold call, I thought, called a manager who had a, a client who was like, you know, who I was wanting to pursue, where that person would say to me, you know what, years ago, Jody, you picked up the phone. So of course I'm picking up the phone for you. Of course, I have no recollection of it, but like I think you treat people how you want them to treat you. Uh, I think it's absolutely true, and for all you folks out there, if, you, if you're gonna make this a career, it's not gonna happen in a day, whether no. you're an artist, whether you're an executive or a music professional, it takes a long time to, to make something happen in this business. Um, so tell me a little bit about that first gig, and you're out there photocopying, you're, you're probably doing anything they ask you anything. to do, right? I um, well, want to talk about how you transitioned okay, that to being thing. a decision maker. I'll tell you maker. exactly how how I transitioned. I was in the I was Xeroxing lead shoots sheets. I would do things like an old songwriter because I was in New York. An old songwriter, like a Broadway songwriter, would need a copy of a lead sheet, and I would do things like beat the messenger because in those we had a lot of messengers. Remember. And I knew that if I left the office, delivered it, I could connect with that person, just shake a hand. I mean, there were writers who like would open the door a little bit, and I'd be like, um, I could have to make that connection, and I could get it done really quick. And to me, that was like, nobody else kind of had that mentality. And so I was just going to do it faster. Then the person who was working in the tape room left. So I thought I was getting a promotion, but no, they put two jobs into one because I could do it. Mm -hmm. The best job I ever had in the music business was being in the tape room because it gave, and of course then it was reel to reels. And I used to have to, yeah. here I went to Northwestern splicing you know, tape. Mm -hmm. But what it gave me was the ability to sit and listen to music and learn that catalog. I still know Chapel's catalog better than I know any catalog that I've worked at. But the other thing is that, um, after everybody left for the day was when my day would begin. Because then I would do what I wanted to do. I would listen to songs and think, okay, in those days it was like, you know, who's pitching songs to Whitney Houston and who's, and somebody gave me really good advice um, at the time and said, you have to make contacts that nobody else here, that the professional managers, so we had, that's what people were called in A&R and publishing then, who they don't know. Who don't our people know? You go. And I met Jelly Bean Benitez. Okay, sure. Nobody else knew him because nobody else was going in that direction. And I would sit in the table, he would tell me who he was looking for songs for, and I would pitch him. And I would, again, show up at his doorstep, here's a cassette, and that's how I did it. And then I realized my talent was recognizing a hit song, and I have an ability, like, my thing is always like what, I, I, I love popular culture. I was never the one that was gonna find some obscure band. I wasn't I'm gonna find it. Nirvana, I, yeah. I, I just wasn't. Mm -hmm. But I was gonna find artists who had, 
who were big pop artists. Now, you're not a musician. No. Right? You come at it from strictly from what I like to call the, you know, the fan side, the consumer side, the, the, the lay schmuck side, where you just listen, you don't care if it's in key, it either makes you feel good or it doesn't. Right? That's correct. As a matter of fact, I grew up listening to songs. Funny that I'm a publisher because I grew up making my own lyrics to songs. Like sometimes I listen to songs now and I go, oh my God, that's what they were saying? Because if the melody didn't hit me, I didn't care. Yeah. What they were saying. It's funny you mentioned that. My sons kid me all the time. How long have I been managing Incubus for years? And I've seen them in concert. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, I don't even know how many times. But I'm constantly hacking their lyrics, right? Because the lyrics you kind of fill in in your own mind, but the hooks to all those songs, the melody to all those songs, you remember forever. And that, I think, is is probably, there's a lesson in that. I'm not a songwriter, but something about melody. Tom Kelly talked about melody in a chorus. Things that that get in your head and don't leave. And we'll talk right. about one of your clients later who has sure. a real knack for doing that. Let me ask you this. You spent six years at Chapel Music, and then you, you so you're now you're starting to be a decision maker, right? And one of the paths in the music business was to work at a company and then take a, take a shot at another company. So you do six years at Chapel Music, and then you meet somebody at EMI Music who hires mm-hmm. you for a, a very long and mm-hmm. long ascent to the top. Mm-hmm. Talk about mm-hmm. that if you would. I left, I was at, sometimes the place you start isn't the place you're going to end up because they see you differently. They That's see the you I'm as making. the person that was in the tape room. It's the comfortable sofa. That's right. <laughs> and so I think, you know, while I'm a, clearly a very loyal person and I don't want to jump around because I do establish relationships with the people I work with and with the talent, but it was just time to go. And I um, kind of put myself out there. And there was a situation at Polygram. There was a situation at other publishing companies. And I met Charles Copland and Marty Bandier, who were then partners at SBK Records and EMI Music Publishing. And I remember meeting Charles first. And I thought, oh, so easy. I could bullshit this guy. So easy. And then I met Marty, who was the business one. And I thought, I have no idea how to make a deal. I didn't have mm-hmm. any idea how to make a deal. I had no idea really how the business works. Oh, how am I going to bullshit this yeah. guy? Charles is going to be my guy. And I got the job. Um, I think I was vice president of East Coast. And I began a very long, close relationship with Marty, who ultimately became... A, a major mentor to me. Now, for the folks that don't know these guys, I'll tell you, you can go and Google it, but mm-hmm. I'll just tell you that between Charlie Koppel, Charles Koppelman, mm-hmm. and Marty Bandier, there haven't been any bigger players in the music business. Mm-hmm. There haven't been guys that smoke any bigger cigars than those guys either, but they were titans. These, it, were, guys it, it, these that, were guys that, that transformed the music publishing oh, business. Oh, they my, made it into comment? like a, 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 a business that was... Sparkly, the, like it went from this kind of like, not mom and pop, but like nobody cared about music publishing. They put a gloss on it. They put a sheen on it. And when you think about their career, they bought CBS songs for what, $125 million? Yeah. And then within two years, sold not only sold it to EMI, doubled what they put into it, then ran the company. Yeah. It was one of my epiphany moments watching that come down as a young guy starting off and watching the business unfold mm-hmm. and, and seeing these guys. And again, not really understanding the publishing business. Um, then I watched that whole thing come down. Then I ultimately got a chance to, to meet Marty, and he was very great with my wife at a, at a point in our lives. Oh, loves. And, and Marty loves the cigars. He loves to play mm-hmm. golf. And so clearly we were destined to have some fun together. But uh, a lovely guy. Let me ask you this. I benefited mightily in my career from mentors, that, that were people that showed you the right way. Was Marty a mentor? Yeah. Absolutely. Marty... And how important is that for a young person starting in the business? It's amazing to have somebody who believes in you and who really gives you the opportunity to have success. We're, you know, uh, he, to this day, is incredibly hard to me and uh, hard on me. Mm-hmm. And I think he makes me the best executive I could be just because I don't want to disappoint him. Um, he's so smart. Mm-hmm. He's an incredible deal maker. Mm-hmm. And still knows more about music than I do. Yeah. It still is, I mean, this guy go watches television with at night, in the middle of the night, with like a pad next to him and writes down songs from commercials. And we'll get a call going, 
Why did uh, Warner Chapel get that song in that commercial? Why did we only have 10 songs in Idol and so and so had 11? Oh, no, no, no. He makes you the best you could possibly yeah. be. Well, obviously, you said something that they allowed you to have some success. And I think part of a great mentor thing, your relationship, is they allow you to fail mm -hmm. from time to time. Because mm -hmm. for me, I don't know about yourself, my best lessons have been arguably at the end of a failure where I sat in the corner and oh, thought, yeah. what the hell was I thinking? And I suspect he allowed you to go through that, but kept you from driving off the cliff. Well, <laughs> he was, the thing is, he was, he had great expectation for me. There was a, there was a time where, I mean, things were like a little rough. I had signed Alicia, we talked about that a little yesterday, when she was 14. And I signed her for a significant amount of money. I just heard this music, heard her voice, and was like, I have to have this. And we signed her. She got dropped by a lab, by Columbia Records. Then she got signed to um, Air, to J Records. There was a period of time, it, it was like five years before her record came out, and Marty used to say to me, oh, okay, she may just be really talented, Jody. I mean, because we had all that money out there. And it's not like the record business, you can hide that stuff. Yeah. It's a but you can't. But, I remember him sitting me down at the peninsula and saying, you know, nothing's happening. And I said, and Alicia hadn't popped yet. And it was a little bit of a dull time. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, you know, I, I want to make movies. And he goes, you're never going to make movies. I go, no, 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 I want to make movies. You want to be my partner. I said, there's so much to do in music movies. And he goes, I don't. And you're not going to make movies. But I'll let you. And I made Drumline with Dallas Austin, who is a writer of mine. And it was because he said I couldn't do it. Yeah. And funny because during that period, like Alicia popped. I mean, you have highs and lows. You just have to be with somebody who believes there'll be highs again. Yeah, and I think guys like Marty are a little bit like Phil Jackson as a coach. He knows how to tweak his players, and sometimes patting them on the ass all the time doesn't get the best no. performance out of no. you. No, know? no. Fair enough. That's, you know, give you a little bit of that. I wanted people to get an insight into how that, because you've had a wonderful career, and it doesn't happen by accident. But the, the, the key elements here, folks, is network your ass off. Make it personal, and if you're lucky enough to find somebody that helps you, don't disappoint them. That's right. <laughs> do great for them, and, and they'll right. do great for you. Let's talk a little bit now about, we'll change gears a little bit. Um, I think in general, folks, they know the publishing business is important. They, they know they should be paying attention to it, but I'm convinced most people, if you ask them, what does a publishing company do, mm -hmm. at best they'd get a C on that answer. So rather than me tell our listeners and viewers you know, what a publisher should do, uh, I thought I'd ask a true professional. You spent your whole life in the music publishing yep. business. Mm -hmm. uh, what does a publishing company do in its most fundamental? Fundamentally, imagine this. Every time you hear a song, you're in an elevator, you're, you turn on the radio, you buy a physical copy of music, you download something from iTunes, um, you, see a so you hear a song in a commercial, you hear a song in a television show, you are at the movie theater and a song comes. Anytime you hear a song, that song had to be licensed and paid for, that's music publishing. My job as a music publisher is to take a song and create the most value for that song. It is a pennies business, but those pennies add up. Um, any, t any version of that song, a karaoke version, um, a, a cover version, an American Idol singer sings a song by Lady Gaga, that song is still making money. A record company only makes money from the artist version of those songs. Yeah. I think that's where people get lost because yeah. they hear a song and they're thinking the record and they're thinking the song and they mix them up, but there is a song underlying that starts on somebody's, not cassette anymore, but starts there, gets pitched, gets record deal, whatever, and, and it winds up on a recording of a rock band, typically they're recording, but for real songwriters, great songs have been covered a thousand times over. Absolutely, and you have to remember that record companies have to pay for the use of songs. Mm -hmm. So every time you buy, a record company sells a song on iTunes for $1.29, whatever it is now, um, nine cents, 
goes to the song, whether it goes to the publisher or the writer, it goes to the song. So that's really the key. Uh, you know, um, I like to give a really quick example of something that nobody thinks about. And I was asked to speak at um, Sony Records because a lot of the people who work there don't understand music publishing. And what I said to them was, you guys, at Epic Records, for instance, you know this artist, Lenka, that you had? Mm-hmm. Was she successful for you? Mm-mm. She was really successful for us. Lenka was somebody that Charlie Walk, that was signed under Charlie. Charles. Big priority, yeah. big priority gonna happen. Completely stiff at radio. The, her, her song, The Show, is a song that was one of the biggest sync songs for us. It was in, it was a commercial in every territory throughout the world. It's currently running, I forget whether it's Target or Crate and Barrel. It was also in the movie, um, um, oh, what was the movie? It was in a movie recently. It was like you hear it so much, and yet for the label, not a success. Yeah. For us, millions of dollars. Because they have in one income. way to win, you got a number of ways. But Correct. let's talk about that. You know, there seems to be this kind of fascination, you know, be, uh, of this notion of indie mm -hmm. versus the mm -hmm. majors. Mm -hmm. And while the majors certainly can, you know, take some share of complicity for all the way the world is. You know, I think that in general, you know, if people think that a big is bad, just as a knee jerk, they're gonna make, they're gonna make a mistake. Um, why should an artist sign to a publishing label? They all go, should I keep my publishing, which sounds romantically and sounds correct. And yet so many artists, great artists, big artists, successful artists, have actually had a publisher involved. Why should an artist sign with a publisher? And you talked a little bit about the syncing so forth. I think if you, if you think you can do it yourself, sure, do it yourself. Me, for instance, I mean, there are a couple of things. There's on the business side, um, in terms of the paperwork of it, Listen, I have an 18-year-old son who's a songwriter, and I tried to do his paperwork <laughs> with Interscope Records. The first cut he had was, was with um, Nicole Scherzinger, and I tried to do that paperwork. It is, I don't know who could do the paperwork. Okay, so then your lawyer could do the paperwork. Um, the, the thing is, if you feel like, if, if, if we together feel like your songs have an opportunity to live in many places, you should have a music publishing. You know, I think, number one, you need your money collected in every territory throughout the world. Not easy to do on your own. The other thing is, we're really in danger right now of losing a tremendous amount of income with all of these new digital things. I mean, we've now withdrawn a lot of our rights from ASCAP and BMI because they're limited in the deals that they can make with the YouTubes of the world. Mm -hmm. So right now, we really have to enforce the rights of songs and make sure songs are licensed and paid for. So that's on the business side. Creatively, for instance, you know, Lady Gaga came to me when I first came to Sony ATV and I signed her for a significant amount of money. I really believed in her. And um, the first thing I did was call to Interscope. What do you guys think about her? Well, we love her, she's great, nothing sounds like her on the radio, and we're not going to radio so fast. I was like, oh, okay, look at my investment. And what we did was, her manager, Troy Carter, and her production company, Vincent Herbert, were, were kind enough and smart enough to give us eight songs to work from Gaga's unreleased album. We took those eight songs and got no less than 25 placements on Gaga songs. So by the time Just Dance was a hit, which was a year and a few months after I signed her, it was, it was number one in the UK and the US, there was already a big campaign in Australia on America's Next Top Model. There was a big, um, I think, ABC image campaign there was tremendous use of her songs in film and TV. So by the time you heard her on the radio, and you know how quick they do mm -hmm. research, sure. there was a recognition. Well, what's interesting about it, and I think this is things that, something that people don't really understand when they think about why should I be with a publisher. It's one thing to write a song. Uh, one of the things we talk about a lot, you, you obviously have to have a great song. But so many of the things that happen after you make that song, write that song, decisions you make after that have a huge impact on the outcome of how it's going to play out. So Jody has a whole team of people mm -hmm. that are out there networking, just like our friend Jake Brisluce, who's in the licensing business, that are out there shaking hands, meeting with 
supervisors meeting with commercial and meeting with advertising agencies. And, and what's been happening today is, is that you're having artists that are breaking through commercials and other means, just like you're talking about, outside of what we used to call the mainstream of the business. Uh, because if you, when artists come to me and say, oh, I got this major deal, and they're going right to radio, and, and I'm like, okay, if there's no story behind you when they go to radio, chances are it's not gonna happen. But you take an art, like I signed this kid, Sammy Adams. Mm -hmm. Um, Sammy is a huge, huge touring base. He's had some success. Um, he's signed to RCA Records. Big priority for him has had one single out. I put him on an Enrique Iglesias single called Finally Found You that he actually wrote, and I asked Enrique to feature him. He did, so it got him radio exposure. We now have this CBS image campaign for his song, The Only One, which was his first single, which is done at the label, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. but alive now for all of us. Yeah. It's interesting. I want to come back to that you know, the the Lady Gaga thing in a bit. But okay. you know, one of the things we try to encourage here, as we we talked about this morning, is getting our you know members involved mm -hmm. in trying to help them network. We're trying to make it easy for you folks. So um, we have a couple questions here today um, from our the folks that have posted it on our event page. And so I want to take one of those right now. Here, you got something for me there, Joe? Now for you folks that are out there, you shy ones. If you don't want to talk, you don't want to be mm -hmm. stepping to the front of the class. You can just go post silently on the page. And that's what a couple of the folks here here. So let's take uh, the question. Throw me a question there, Joe. What do you got? Okay, there we go. Okay. This is from Mike Sarah, who's one of our members, says, do you look for artists that have big followings or does that really matter? What exactly do you look for when you sign? I know you never get asked that, Jody, but take a shot at it. Okay. We, I look for an artist who has the vision. They have, first of all, they have to have hit songs. So it's not like music publishing is you know just because you have a great touring business doesn't mean you have great songs. So that doesn't help my business. Yeah. That's not a music publishing thing. That's an important point. Right, <laughs> but I also think it's about having hit songs. Yes, because we're so big, it's hard for us to start something from scratch every once in a while we do. But I think it's about an artist who has real vision and a plan and yes, somewhat of a following. Yeah, I think that's so important. We talk about that a lot today. This whole you have to that, start it. Well, today you have to start it. You used to be able to count on your publisher and the record company, and they had the muscle and, and they had all the means. Today, that a lot of that infrastructure is broken down, or it was broken, right? Or is on the way of being broken. So today, more than ever, artists kind of have to get this fuck the gatekeeper, I'm going to make it happen mentality, right? They do. And they have to. And no matter, it used to be, it was like the rock guys, that the ones on the road. Now, if you look at the hip hop artists that are happening, they're the ones that spend time on the road and who are not dependent upon hit singles or radio. Kendrick Lamar, all these guys have done their, ASAP, have done their time on the road just like the rock guys have done historically. And they haven't had to do that in the past. Yeah, well, that's, uh, as the business is, is transformed, the live part of your income as an artist, I'll speak as a guy who manages a rock band, um, it is a huge part of the deal there. So if all you ever got is a big hit record, you better figure out how to max it out because if you look at that top 10 pole star list, it's a bunch of country acts, a bunch of rock act, and That's one right. pop act, Justin Bieber right now. And I say, Justin, God bless you, but be smart, man. You know, don't, don't be dumb out there. Let me get another question here. We have a, a singer-songwriter uh, mm -hmm. that I've gotten friendly with. I love the internet. You, I feel like I've mm -hmm. met friends all around the right. world, you know? And so today we're inviting him into our, our, our office here. Uh, Laura, for, who's with a, a group called Barley Cove, had a question today. She says, Jody, how does an unknown artist get their mu music noticed by a powerhouse such as Sony? Are demo quality tracks even considered... Uh, album quality tracks. I, I guess they want to know how they even get in mm -hmm. your world, not so much what you're looking for, but how would we even get there to find out? Well, a couple of ways. Number one, anytime someone calls us about someone, they, um, you know, I always have like assistants in the office checking out mm -hmm. stuff. I think you don't go to the top. I think you find someone who works at the, like you don't come to me. Every once in a while I'll hear something, I'll be like, oh my God, this is amazing. But I will hand it to somebody. So why not start with some, I have so many ambitious, amazing assistants who work for me. Everyone who works for me gets to touch music. Find somebody else, find somebody other, don't start at the top, that's one. And two, develop relationships with well-known 
or successful or working writer producers. Yeah, I think I'm so happy to hear you say that because you know, it, you know, I'm, I'm I've been doing this a while here now, and while I still try to keep up on what's going on, there's a little part of me that gets a little distrustful of my instincts because part of being in pop culture is is actually being in it, right? Mm -hmm. So I have some great resources here right at my house. My 16 year old son Evan Rennie, Matt yep. Rennie, 19. We we're going to be doing a, a show with the Glitch Mob. You know, mm -hmm. who I'm vaguely familiar with. But I asked my son Matt Rennie, you know, how's that look? And it's great. So for you folks that are out there, don't get yourself all pissed off and disappointed because Jody Gerson is not listening to it. People like Jody have a network of people that they test stuff. Is that fair That's comment? Right. Yeah, that they listen. That they have the time. They want to make a mark too. They want to be the next Jody Gerson. That's right. So. <laughs> Let them do it. Yeah. You know, so I signed an artist recently, or I was looking at an artist recently, who kept saying to me that L.A. Reid signed her. L.A. Reid didn't sign her. Somebody who worked for L.A. signed her. And you know what? L.A. Reid was looking me. for a new suit. Let's be freaking <laughs> honest, okay? I don't even care if you're no watching comment. L.A. Jesus, yeah, I can be dis... Well, I can... We'll move on. Uh, I, heard, I heard the phone ring, Joe. Did somebody actually step and call the hotline? Did. Oh, my God. Who, who is it? All right, let's put her on. Mandy, are you, are you there, Mandy? Yes, I am. Hi. Oh, great. You're here with Jody Gerson. Hi, Mandy. Um, Hi, Jody. Yeah, by the way, I want to thank you for being so bold, Mandy. You know, <laughs> I'm going to give you an A. When I haven't even heard your question, so I'll butt Yay, out. You talk to Mandy. Jody. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not very often that you get this kind of opportunity. So, um, so my question is, um, well, I'm actually an aspiring music supervisor. Mm -hmm. And um, my question to you, Jody, is that seeing as a music su supervisor is both a creative and also a business-oriented position, mm -hmm. how do you consolidate the two skill sets? Like, what does it really take to be a successful music supervisor? You know, music supervisors have become almost like A&R people. Used to be mm -hmm. they were just given the music to go place. Now they're finding it because most music supervisors want to be the first on the block to have something. So I think that um, the people who continue to get work in film and TV are the people who know how to do the bit, how to license and know how to pick the right songs. And I think if I were you, I'd find, I mean, there, you know, there are music publishing companies, there are all these independent sync companies, find one of those guys, intern for them, see if you can get an assistant job there. You know, or if you have friends who are creating opportunities, you know, with online programming, music supervised for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. There you have it, Does Mandy. that help you? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Okay. Mandy, when you get that job and you get very successful, I want to make sure you come on the show so I can meet you. You bold thing. I love that. I'd love that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good luck to you. Thanks for calling. Um, nice. I, I love the internet. It's like you're having a party. You never have to ask anybody to leave. You just it's so of, true. Yeah, nobody's okay, stealing your beer. I used to say it all the time, it's the greatest thing ever happened backstage. No dramas, you know, yeah. nobody hitting on the band girl. It's beautiful. Uh, do we have any questions in the chat room here, Audrey? She has one. Uh, we have one question. Is that your question, Audrey? Uh, well, I have one from Deborah. Okay, we have one from Deborah. I promised uh, Audrey that she okay. could ask a question okay. here, too. Okay, fire away. What's the question, Audrey? Okay, so um, Deborah is a vocal coach, and she says that most of her students have their own small publishing companies, mm -hmm. and she wants to know if it would serve them better if they formed, formed a sort of co-op and created an umbrella company, and if that would get more attention from major publishing companies. I think it's all about whether they have hit songs or not, and if they can generate activity. Everybody has a music, all deals are now co-publishing deals, so everybody has their own publishing company. The question is, what, how does that publishing company serve them? So if together as a collective, it works better, then yeah, great. I, I think it's interesting because everybody will talk, and I get you know, letters and emails from folks asking about how to start a publishing. You know, starting your own publishing company as a songwriter is easy. You file a piece of That's paper. It. What you're doing, you know, and not to, to, to diminish what, you know, every buyer should have their own public, but what you're doing is running a big company that deals with catalogs, you know, catalog acquisition, which is Marty and Charles's specialty, and also at the very same time, working with songwriters. And, and the key difference is, is that your team, you got a whole team of people, floors full of people that are going out on that selling part of the well, song process. To find 
opportunities to bring that. every single day for all yeah. of our songwriters. And that is a much different animal than starting your own little publishing. But very quickly, mm -hmm. the reason that artists started having their own publishing companies, co-publishing deals, is remember, for, for many years, Brill Building Days, there were songwriters, there were publishers, there were singers. So the publisher pitched the songwriter's song to the singer. Then came the Beatles and the yeah. Stones and all these guys who wrote their own songs who said, wait a second, why should I give 100% of my publishing away? I write that and I sing it. And that's how publishing, that's how co-publishing deals came into yeah, We had a little uh, primer on that from Mario Gonzalez again. Again, you you know, go. another one where you gotta get the charts out and everything, but I'll tell people, you know, write a big hit song. That's it. And, and you'll figure it out. The Beatles gave away their publishing. You know, it looks like Paul's still that's how doing we pretty our well. Company. Yeah, yes. ATV was that, right? Yes. So, uh, okay, great. Uh, okay, back again here. Um, Audrey, you had a question. Sorry, I almost, I almost forgot. We don't pay Audrey anything, so I feel like I have to help I'll her out here. Ask away, so, Audrey. Audrey, uh, by the way, for you folks, that was our intern from uh, Montreal, Canada, who came all the way to L.A. and to get in the music business, and so you now have a chance to speak to somebody who's been doing it. Go ahead, yeah, Audrey. So I just wanted to know from you, as a woman in the industry, I know that you were saying at the beginning it was really a man's club, and I feel like it still is, I mean, mm -hmm. less so, but what would you say, as a woman, you need to really make it out there? I've seen being a woman as being an advantage and a disadvantage, but I didn't. I don't ever dwell on the disadvantage. The thing is, I don't play golf, and I don't play. You know, I don't go to basketball games, and you know what? I don't necessarily want to be in that club, um, and that's okay. I will say there are many fabulous women in the music business, and I think that the new kind of generation of, of women coming up are kind of like hanging out together in the same way the guys hang out together. It's okay. To me, the key was that I could have a career and children and a family. That was the big thing. And music publishing was the right career so that I could have that. I, I think that's an interesting point because, you know, I grew up, in that time in the business where there were a lot of big players in the business, there were women, you know, Polly Anthony at Epic Records, Michelle Anthony, who was, you know, basically Huge. keeping all the, the, yeah. the guys somewhat in check. That's frankly, right. Frankly, if, if everybody was being honest, she was the conscience of the place. I think of Sylvia Roan, I think of Brenda Romano. Oh, Brenda, oh, different because Brenda was always about her family too. Brenda, well, but that's a, okay, the, I don't know her as Brenda well. Brenda was, the generation before me, mm -hmm didn't have what my generation has. I guess that's what I was leading to, is that some of those folks, and they did unbelievably well, but one of the things they sacrificed was family. You know, that's Polly correct. and God love her and Michelle, they, they, they made a commitment and it was yeah. so all consuming that, that they, they weren't able to do that. So I, 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 you how know do what, you Steve, balance all I of that? I think it's about knowing your place. Honestly, mm. my, I, I remember when Jimmy Iovine started that Tom Tom Club across the street from Interscope and I said to Polly, Ooh, you don't go there. And she's like, yeah. And I'm thinking, Jimmy Amy doesn't want to be hanging out with us at that place. So you know your place. And I never was upset about things like that. Never bothered me. I don't want to be there either. I don't want to be at strip clubs with artists. That's not where I want to be. Yeah. I knew my place. I knew when it was time to go home. Yeah. Did that hurt my career? I don't think so. Well, because you delivered at the place they needed to deliver. You, you know, going to all those things. And I made it clear. Things. I made it very, the, the real answer is, I was very clear as to who I was and, you know, did it hurt me, help me? I think in some ways it helped me a lot. Some ways it may have hurt me a little, but if it hurt me a little, I, I, I made the choice. I'm going to say you're the president of the, the biggest publishing company in the world. I don't, I'm not it sure I can identify me. the hurt, it didn't uh, hurt uh, me. very easily. And there's no here. bitterness there. Yeah. It didn't hurt me. Okay, we're going to do, uh, we've got to wrap it up here a little bit. So i got a couple more things, you know. Um, one of the great things about having this little show is I've gotten a chance to reconnect with so many of my friends in the business and be able to talk to them at kind of a, a big picture level of the business. And so we've managed to amass this great little treasure trove of video clips and so forth. And from time to time, I'll go back and see things that are kind of thought provoking. So I want to pull a little clip here. Um, uh, that talks about the state of the business because on the one hand there are some people that are very cynical about the music business going forward and there are other folks that see it in a slightly different way. So I want to play you this little clip, see if it spurs something, then I want okay. you to talk, I want to okay, talk about so it with you. Fire away. 
Tom York warned young musicians not to tie themselves to the sinking ship of the music industry, arguing it is on the verge of collapse. You don't work for a major label now. You don't get a paycheck from those guys. Not that you weren't honest before, but how do you respond to a, a gentleman like Martin Locko? I disagree with Tom York. And the reason why I disagree is because the music industry is not static. The music industry is whatever the business of music is today. And that music industry just happens to be very different than the music industry that I believe Tom York is referring to when he says tying yourself to, to the music industry. And so what I mean by that is that truly great art can be good business and you have to respect that art and not, not bastardize that art with this idea that if you bastardize it, you're gonna have more success in business. Mm -hmm. I actually believe it's the opposite. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you really celebrate and, 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 and enhance and, and, and focus on the art, that's how you're gonna have successful business. But it is a business. So today, Martin, there is a music industry and what you do is yes. defining what the music mm -hmm. industry is today. Every day, people are reinventing what the music industry mm -hmm. is today. And it's the way I look at it is it, it's a river, not a lake. Yeah. Okay, it's moving. And, and the people that think out of the box are going to help redefine what the music biz, what the music industry is. Mm -hmm. Why say I'm not going to be part of? I'm not going to tie myself to it. You want to not tie yourself to it. You want to help reinvent. Interesting thoughts there about the business, you know. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the business has changed a bunch since you and I started. You and I are still a part of the business. We haven't gone off into the, to the wild. What's your take on the, the future of the business, and, and what parts of it have changed that you're adjusting to today? First of all, I'm incredibly optimistic about it. I don't know that I'm not optimistic about the major label business, mm -hmm. but I am. People want music more than ever before, it defines their lives. Advertisers want it, brands want to be associated. I mean, it's, it defines their lives. So I think it's just changing. And I think the great thing is that people could do it themselves mm -hmm. and create new models. From, I don't think you can have a major hit, although look at Lumineers, you know? They're few and far between, but if you do the work, if you could figure out how to afford to, and you can get investors from people who, so many people want to invest in music, you don't have to rely on a major label. I do believe that for the most part, to have a big global hit, you need them, but I think not without doing the work. I tell people all the time, okay, you're signed to a major label, now what are you gonna do? If you decide at this point to hand over the reins, you're crazy. Yeah. So I'm optimistic. I just think that kind of everybody can do it just with new models. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the fear and insecurity for most folks because um, the business has been so wacky that when you find something that works, you want to hang on to it. And I think in some ways, I think maybe the labels hung on to something they did, that now was artists, working too Right, well. but artists have power now. It's not like, oh my God. You know, remember the years that labels had huge Grammy parties? Yeah. They yes. remember the years when artists yeah. started having their own yeah. and they didn't have to go to, to, yeah. the, to the major. And now parties have gotten smaller because a label head can't say to an artist anymore, you have to go. Yeah. I own you. Yeah, it's interesting. We, you talked about Lady Gaga, one of the, the Berkeley School of Music. I'm actually teaching a class there now. I had an article about, you know, the importance of managers and artists now yeah. in terms of driving. I want to go back to the, uh, to the Lady Gaga thing for just a minute, and then we'll have some closing stuff. She came to your office one day, and I want you to tell this story, and then I want you to talk about, you know, her manager, Troy Carter, oh, and, sure. and how important sure. that team is and the vision is to getting successful. Absolutely. Tell the story. It's a great story here, folks. I'm was at EMI Music Publishing for 17 years. I left with a change of management and then went to work at Sony, which was a small company, hadn't been around a long time, not the big grand company of EMI. And I was like, what am I doing here? And I needed something. I needed an artist, I needed a signing, I needed something. And my friend Vincent Herbert brought Lady Gaga and I'd heard about her and I said, could you just bring her in? Everybody had passed on her at my company she was the, an intern at Famous Music Publishing, and they still, she worked for Erwin Robinson. I did not know that. Um, and everybody <laughs> passed on her, and my company, everywhere else. She sat down, and she said, I am going, and she sat down, she was kind of wearing like shorts over her tights, 
bad wig, blonde, I don't know if you remember that, that first blonde wig. And she said to me, I'm gonna be the biggest star in the entire world. I'm gonna be such a massive star. And when, when I get money, Jody, I am going to invest it in myself. It's not about me making money, it's about investing in my show, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, then she sat down on the piano and I was like, oh, I'm signing her. And I learned a lot from Gaga. Number one, she drives the show. Troy Carter had had tremendous success with Eve and a couple other people, but wasn't at a high point of his career when he met Gaga. He says that Gaga made him a better manager. He, she keeps him on his toes. He has to be forward thinking. His life has changed because she drove us all. And I remember sitting in marketing meetings with her at Interscope where she said, this is what I want to do. I want to drive through LA in a, in, a, in, a, in a clear carriage and blah, blah, blah. Things that either happened or didn't happen, she drove the ship and she continues to drive it. And I think a good manager, as you know, protects their clients, but follows their lead. It's, it's such an important point. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, the, the artist has to have the vision. And when they can sense what their true north is, and it's really who they are, and they're committed to they're it. They're clear. People, it shows up. If an artist is, wants to check the wind, when artists tell me, what should I be doing? I get immediately suspicious of something. And they'll actually, it, it's just like you described. You should really be telling me how it's going to be. And then you and I can talk about, OK, that's the idea. OK, now let me figure out how I'm going to make that happen from the business side of things. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great story. I mean, it's something we preach here all the time. You got to figure out who you are. You got to commit to it. I have and to you believe have to it. Drive. Yeah, you, we all have to believe that that person is true. And you know, recently in the press, there's been that thing about the Tommy Mottola book mm -hmm. with with Mariah. Yeah. In those days, a Tommy Mottola could say, "Okay, that girl has a great voice. I'm going to create it." Clive could say, "Whitney Houston, star. I'm going to fill her up with songs. Mm -hmm. People bought into, and I'm going to make it a priority. And I'm going to spend whatever it takes to make this happen." Yeah. There it are did, artists that anymore. actually need to be told a little bit, I'm convinced. Uh, Maybe Mariah was and one of them, but not Lady from Gaga. Themselves. You know? And um, protected from themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, and in some ways, you know, that was, I was there during that. It was an interesting time. Um, it's a great lesson there, folks. you got to drive. you got to make other people believe. If you don't believe Absolutely. it, they're not going to believe. Okay, That's I want right. to end with a couple other little bits here that we talk about. You've been, I was sorry we wanted to speak to the artists and the musicians out here. You know, in, in closing today, if you were going to give advice to an artist, a young songwriter, or, you know, performer, somebody that's just starting off with all your experience, what would you tell them about I this business I would tell today? them, if they live in Philadelphia, create a following in Philadelphia, create relationships, create fans online, build it. Start out here and it will, if you're that good, it will grow. And then if your goal is to, to sign to a major label, that major label will find you. It's always better when they find you. And they're always looking at um, radio stations and what are the secondary, secondary whatever market saying, is third, market. Yeah. Something's <laughs> happening out of here. There's something that everybody wants to sign right now. And it's because somebody saw that it's being played in some. So I think that's the key. Start it yourself, build a fan base online, write great songs, Write with whoever you need to to get the best songs possible. Don't be precious. Um, they, if you're that good, they will find you. And your best friend can manage you yeah. as long as you have the vision yeah. and your best friend is smart. And one final, for the, for the business folks out there that, that look at somebody like you or look at a big-time manager or record exec and say, I want to be like that, what advice would you have for the Audrey Benwalids or the you know, the young Steve Rennies out there of the world that are just starting off in the business. Like, what would you tell them? I think it's about treating people the way you want to be treated. I think it's about being open and listening. I know I did a lot of talking here, but what I find now is I stop for a second and listen because there are a lot of young people out there who know more than I do about a lot of things. Yeah. And so I think my, and also for me in my career, my career is completely dependent upon my relationships. Folks, you've heard it from just about everybody who sits here. It's a similar story. I'm being honest. It, well, it, it's because there are certain fundamentals, and being honest is a part of it. Because if you're not, if you come, come back and see somebody again, best not to lie to them out of the box.